Doc, before you get to the science of how we see, I'd like to introduce you to the big eye. Well, it's true. The human eye has often been compared to the workings of a camera. You step right this way, Doc. Now, suppose we start with a lens. You can see inside the sunbox. The light coming through the lens is focused on the film. Now, this is the iris. And we can regulate the way it opens and closes to admit various degrees of light. Now, suppose we look at the side. Now, the film moves down here, where the light coming through the lens strikes it. So this is where the negative is exposed? Yes, that's right. Well, Hal, your camera is a fine machine for taking moving pictures. Now, let's look at something much more remarkable. This is a close-up of a normal human eye. The periodic blinking of our lid keeps the outer eye surface moist. Up under the lid, and at each corner of the eye are tiny glands manufacturing tears which wash away dirt particles and contain an antibiotic to combat germs. The iris opens and closes automatically to control the amount of light admitted through the pupil to the inner eye. Ever wonder what a doctor sees when he looks inside your eye? Well, here it is, the retina, the only place in a living man where some of his nervous system can be seen. This part of the eye compares to the film in the camera. It's on this delicate screen that all objects of our vision are transformed into myriad electrical impulses. This is the blind spot where the nerve fibers of the retina come together to form the optic nerve which bundles them out to the brain. There are no light receptors at this point, so it is literally a blind spot. Now in this diagrammatic side view, light reflected from an object strikes the transparent surface of the eye, the cornea. The iris opens or closes to the correct aperture. The light passes through the lens, which brings it into focus on the retina. This curved screen contains over 125 million tiny light-sensitive cells, each capable of dispatching an individual message to the brain. In this photomicrograph of the cross-section of the retina, we can actually see some of these cells. This depression is the fovea. Here we have our sharpest vision, concentrated in an area the size of a pinhead. This is the visual center of the eye. Looking at something means catching its image on the fovea. We have two kinds of light-sensitive cells, cones and rods. The cones in bright light transmit our color vision. In dim light, they cease to work and the rods take over. Rods transmit our vision only in black and white. This is why, as daylight deepens into dusk, colors dim and fade away. Here's a diagrammatical close-up of the rod. Each rod and cone is sensitive to light because of a pigment contained in its tip. When this colored substance is struck by light, it's chemically changed. This excites the nerve, sending messages to the brain, which enable us to see. This, then, is the human eye, an organ which inspires poets as well as scientists. For it is the eye that gives us the colorful, ever-changing world of vision. In order to examine the last of Aristotle's five senses, the sense of touch, let's drop in on this gentleman to whom we have already been introduced. Return again to that road map of his sensory system and out to that suburb we visited before. And it's a well-populated place because in one tiny area we find not only the sense of touch, but at least four other senses. These are true senses, just like Aristotle's major five, for each has its own signal system and nerve endings that can be individually identified. For example, these are the free nerve endings of pain. There are millions upon millions of these tiny filaments throughout our bodies. Well, Gene, why don't you try one of your real life dramas to show how this team of senses operates? Okay. Let's take the situation of a lady testing a hot iron. Bill here has consented to act the exacting role of housewife. I'm one of those martyrs to science you hear about. <laughs> okay, let's run through the whole act. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> and here's the way it works. Now, in slow motion, when the tip of the finger touches that hot surface, 
a number of things happen and happen fast. Hundreds of pain endings charge into action. What? Sends out information on surface conditions. Heat and cold report the temperature changes on the skin. Pressure reacts to the sensation of finger against iron. So these sensory messages race up the finger and the arm and reach the spinal cord, where there's something like, uh, oh, an automatic switchboard, where pain triggers an immediate reflex action as well as continuing to the brain. Now the reflex signal races back and activates the muscles of the arm and the finger is jerked away from the iron. And it's only when the other sensory messages report in on the master receiver and the pain impulse finally reaches the thalamus that our little man knows the finger has been hurt. Well, isn't it true, doctor, that some people are more sensitive to pain than others? Oh, yes, yes, that's very true. People differ greatly in this. Doctor, will you sit down? Thank you. Really enormous variations in what we call the threshold of pain. Some people are born with no sense of pain at all. No toothache. That bad? It was really very serious. To touch a hot iron, cut yourself badly and feel no pain. Imagine a child who would have to be watched every second because he would never know when he'd hurt himself. What about the other senses, Doc? Sense of humor, sense of balance, common sense, horse sense. Well, these are everyday expressions, commonplaces, figures of speech, except the sense of balance, and that's a very real sense. Without the sense of balance, you couldn't stand up. Certainly, you couldn't walk. And behind this sense of balance is a most interesting mechanism. Within the inner ear, we have the semicircular canals, which are filled with liquid. Associated with the lining of these curved channels are minute hair cells. Now, it's generally believed that when we move our heads, the liquid disturbs these hair cells, which send signals to the brain. We also have sense receptors in our muscles and tendons that tell the brain of any change in muscle tension. When Bill stands on one foot, he can feel this automatic interplay of the different muscles of his legs. And of course, his eyes tell him what he does. Coordinating all of this information from ears, muscles, and eyes at assembly points, the nervous system sends back reflex motor impulses to the right muscles telling them to tighten or relax to keep the body in balance. This automatic feedback between the incoming signals and the outgoing compensating actions is what enables a cat to land on its feet or an acrobat to spin through the air to a precise landing. Now in slow motion, we can see what happens when a cat is dropped from an upside down position. His eyes and the equilibrium organs in his ears cause him to right his head. This puts an uneven tension on the neck muscles, and their tension receptors excite reflexes, which bring the body back into alignment with the head. And like the falling cat, we too are constantly getting sensory reports, which themselves induce the next motion. This series of reflexes involving what is known as feedback results in controlled and accurate motion. Hey, Doc, what do they got to say about tickling? <laughs> Well, seriously, some physiologists say that tickling should be considered a real sense. I'd like to see you make a character out of that one. You know, the more we talk about the senses, the more characters we seem to be getting. It's getting to be like a regular three-ring, uh... Circus? Yeah. Ta-da!